Hi, I'm Carol Majewski, and I'm the Associate Chief Quality <coughs> Officer for Patient Experience at Dartmouth-Hitchcock, and I'll be your moderator for today's presentation. We're glad you've joined us for the second in our four-part COVID-19 series called We're Here For You, We're Open, We're Safe, and We're Clean. For those of, us who, for those of you who joined us last week, um, I've made my appointments for screening exams, have you? So we put this series together to respond to some of the questions we've been hearing from patients and community members about whether it's safe to come in for your scheduled appointments or for emergent care while COVID-19 is still such a part of our everyday lives. To answer those concerns, we've put together another great panel to provide the information that you need to feel comfortable about seeing your doctors. Now, because Dartmouth-Hitchcock is a system with member hospitals and communities throughout Vermont and New Hampshire, we thought it was important to share with you what our member hospitals have been doing in their facilities to keep you and your family safe. Before we start, I wanna be sure to mention that if you have questions for our panelists, please send us a note at social at hitchcock.org. If I have time, we'll get the panelists to respond during the program. If not, we'll post the answers to your question on the website geo.dh.org slash recovery. Okay, so let me introduce you to today's panelists. They are Dr. Rachel Lovins, who is Vice President and Medical Director of Acute Care Services at Cheshire Medical Center. Dr. Danielle Parati, Vice President of Patient Care Services, Visiting Nurse and Hospice for Vermont and New Hampshire. Dr. Brian Frankowicz, Medical Director of New London Hospital Medical Group and Dr. Michael Lynch, Chief Medical Officer at Alice Peck Day Memorial Hospital. Thank you all for participating on the panel today. So thanks for having to be here. Happy all right, so here. I'm gonna start with um, Dr. Lovins from Cheshire. Rachel, can you start by sharing with us a quick overview of Cheshire Medical and the communities and the patients that you serve? I'd be happy to. So Cheshire Medical Center is a nonprofit health center that takes care of the Monadnock community New Hampshire and has been doing that ever since it opened as Elliott Community Hospital in 1892. Our community includes not just the area around Keene, but also we take care of many patients from Southern Vermont and other patients from other areas in New Hampshire. We are the largest employer in the area with 1,500 staff members that live and volunteer in our community. And we are much more than just a hospital because we have a very large primary care program we have dozens of specialists, and we have other programs such as rehabilitation, a cancer center, and pregnancy and birth. Being part of the Dartmouth-Hitchcock system since 2015 has also given us access to hundreds of specialists that we may not have directly on our campus. Oh, so you have a lot of activity going on down there. Yes, we do. All right. So Rachel, it was around, um, I think, the end of February when we all became aware of the COVID-19 virus. What has Cheshire Medical Center done since then to ensure the safety of patients as they return to the hospital for regular appointments? It's a really good question. Um, as everyone knows, it's just been a crazy six months and we've all learned so much. And as a system, we've learned so much together and learning from each other that I really feel like now we are safer than we have ever been. Like we know what we're facing and we know how to keep ourselves safe. So. Um, one thing that we have, first of all, we have enough PPE, which is personal protective equipment. We have enough stores to keep everyone in the hospital safe. And that means everyone that works here from environmental people to dietary, to nurses, to physicians, to all the patients and any visitor that comes in. Um, we have trained everyone in appropriate use of PPE. Every patient is screened twice. You'll probably find that throughout the entire system. So you'll be screened once over the phone for your history and any concerning symptoms. And then you're also screened at the door and that includes temperature check. Staff is also screened every single day at the door. Anyone who has a concerning history or symptoms is, is sent to a nurse specialist that can do a further workup. All staff all visitors, all patients are masked at all times in any facility. And if you have a face-to-face -face encounter with any clinician, that clinician will be in a face mask and also a face shield because that's been shown to decrease transmission to practically zero. Um, 
important thing that we've started just recently in the last few months is pre-procedure testing. So anyone who's coming in for a non-urgent or emergent procedure that gets done in the OR or endoscopy, like the colonoscopy you've been putting off, um, gets uh, pre-procedure COVID testing. We have our own machine in-house. We can usually get results back within eight hours, sometimes it takes a day. Um, so if it's not urgent and you've test positive and you're asymptomatic, you may be asked to wait a couple of weeks to come in. And if you're negative, you can go ahead to be extra safe. Even if you're negative and you come in for a procedure, everyone in the procedure room is still in full, full PPE because we wanna be extra safe. Um, I just wanted to mention that the whole Dartmouth-Hitchcock system and all of its affiliates have the ability to use telehealth appointments so if you wanna come in and see your provider and you don't physically need to be in the building, we can use telehealth to see you and I'll let my colleagues uh, on this uh, call go into more detail about that. So thanks, Rachel. Um, you know, it's amazing you, you defined what PPE is and I think back and say a year ago, probably most of the people in our nation other than uh, healthcare workers really didn't know the term PPE. And now it's as common as, as talking about milk, bread, and eggs. Uh, you know, PPE yeah. just flows into every conversation. So what you've described, I have to imagine that we've got similar processes in place at APD and New London. And, and Mike and Brian, would you agree with that? I would agree with that. Yes, we've, uh, we've all been working together to, to uh, one of the great things about being part of a system is that we are working together closely. Uh, to standardize best practices, figure out what is the safest way to deliver care and do that consistently. And I think you, you would find that, as Rachel was saying, we're doing similar things at APD. And I think Brian will mention doing similar things at New London and working with uh, uh, visiting nurse associations. So I, I, it, it's been a, a great part and we meet weekly uh, and talk about uh, where things are in terms of safety and best practices. And I, so you'll hear a lot of similar comments, I think, today. Okay, well, Mike, while I've got you talking, can you share a little bit about Alice Peck Day Hospital and um, sure. what APD is doing to manage for the safety of our pa for their patients? Sure, absolutely. So, um, uh, first of all, APD has been serving uh, the Lebanon community in Upper Valley since 1932. Um, and we have uh, been affiliate of Dartmouth Hitchcock Health since 2016. And again, there have been uh, as we've seen in, in this uh, pandemic, a lot of benefits to that affiliation and working together. But speaking specifically for APD, and I'm very proud to represent APD and the work that's been done, um, we are uh, seeing increased volume, performing surgeries, doing office visits, and a similar number in manner to, uh, similar number, but not manner to uh, prior to COVID. And we're doing this safely uh, without transmission. And the, the team at APD has done an amazing job, and I'm really proud of the work that they've done. It's heartening to see our patients returning for the routine care that they need, uh, and they cannot defer. Um, I was taking care of uh, I'm an emergency physician uh, and have uh, work, had the benefit of working in a couple of different places to see the similar practices that are occurring. But when it's working the ED at APD, um, had a patient uh, uh, joking yesterday saying, uh, you, you shouldn't advertise uh, anymore because you become so busy. But we're, we are busy and it's good and people are getting the care that they need and, and safely. Um, and we're doing this, uh, as Rachel said, by screening. Um, you will get screened if you're going into multi-specialty clinic uh, before the appointment at the time at the door and then reassessed uh, when you're in the room so that we know you're safe and other people are safe if you happen to have symptoms, you can be seen in a separate respiratory clinic uh, by teams that, again, are using appropriate PPE and uh, screening and testing when appropriate. Uh, also, uh, you will be asked to mask when you enter the building, uh, any of our buildings. Uh, washing your hands is important for you as it is for us as providers, and then uh, using appropriate social distancing. So you'll have chairs that you would mark to sit in in the waiting rooms that have been very thoughtfully laid out. Um, and then also, uh, as Rachel mentioned, you, we're using uh, telehealth. Uh, a great example is we do a lot of surgeries at APD. And if you have a post-op appointment, uh, that's really just uh, how are you doing to look at a wound. Um, it's, it's a really great way to integrate uh, telehealth that, that we're doing well at APD in addition to appropriate primary care visits or if you have a simple question or something that can be handled over a video or telephone visit. And this is going to rapidly evolve also. 
Wow, thank you. So well, I was actually gonna ask you, but I think you've answered for our patients about what they could do to minimize the risk of infection and transmission. And you talked about hand washing and wearing a mask and things. And I know one of the things that patients want to know is what can they do before they come in for an appointment that will not only be helpful to them, but also to protect the clinical staff, not only at APD, but across our system. Patients are very interested in, in making sure they're taking care of us too, which I, which I think is really nice. So what would, what would we tell them they could do for us? Yeah, no, it's really true. And I, I think is, you know, I think patients do care. And, and, and the, I think the thing that we're seeing uh, in, in New England, and particularly our part of New England, that we've been very successful uh, because we're being smart and we're being compassionate and uh, we're wearing a mask because we don't want to risk uh, the asymptomatic transmission of the virus to somebody else when we're uh, out in public or in gatherings and you can continue to be safe at home and when you're out in public to be uh, thoughtful, uh, smart and compassionate. And again, we've just been, we've done a great job with this and we will continue to do this with these behaviors. Uh, so masking, washing your hands, um, and being really thoughtful about <laughs> symptoms. If you have any questions about symptoms, call your appointment. We have ways to get you seen uh, and can help you work through uh, if you have questions about any symptoms that you have prior to your appointment or things that might have changed. Uh, and when you arrive, be, be ex expect to be screened uh, by a, a pleasant, friendly greeter who's smart and uh, has really uh, done doing, uh, been doing this a lot and knows how to do it and embrace the screening questions. Uh, and another thing that... Um, uh, to mention is just go over the visitor policy before you arrive, depending on what your appointment is, whether it's an office or it's a pediatric visit, or if you have an overnight stay, or if it's the same day surgery, uh, this is evolving. And again, we're, we are uh, working together, all of us, uh, everybody on this call to figure out um, what, what the best thing is at the time and things, things will change. Prevalence can change. And, and so just, that's another thing to do. Check, check the site, make it, a, you know, if you have questions about the visitor policy, uh, do that before you arrive. Great. Thank you. That I am so glad you brought that up because we do hear that as a concern a lot. And the website really does have the most up-to-date information on, um, how, yeah. safe, you know, what you can do to help keep the environment safe. So um, I have to say, as somebody who's worked in the Dartmouth-Hitchcock system a long time, I really enjoy hearing about our system members and their communities. Um, so Dr. Frankowicz, can you tell us a little bit about New London Hospital and the community that you serve? Yeah, um, thanks for asking. New London Hospital is a 25-bed critical access hospital. Um, um, we are the first affiliate um, of the Dartmouth-Hitchcock um, system. Um, we're located about a half hour south of Dartmouth in New London. We serve 15 um, communities um, that surround. We have two locations, um, New London Hospital, um, which has a robust primary care um, practice, including adult medicine, pediatrics, um, family medicine. Um, we also have 17 different specialties um, that come to New London Hospital. Most of them are through Dartmouth Hitchcock, um, including a very robust orthopedic practice. Um, our Newport Health Center, um, which is 13 miles to the west, is a rural health center, which um, helps serve that community um, in a little different way. They, they have pediatrics as well as adult medicine and women's health um, located there. Um, our um, emergency department is staffed by um, physicians 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and we have our own EMS service, um, which is um, help support this community um, with transfers as well as supporting the volunteer services um, in the small towns that we, we serve. Wow. So, um, you know, we've heard from both Rachel and Michael about the practices at their site. What could uh, patients that are visiting either New London Hospital or the um, Newport, the clinic in Newport, expect when they arrive there? Right, you're gonna, you're gonna see um, very much the same stuff as the other affiliate hospitals. Um, our motto since the beginning of um, the COVID pandemic has been screen and clean. Um, so like Mike and Rachel have said, um, we screen all our patients um, on the phone before they um, come in. When you arrive at the hospital, you'll get a second screening um, by one of our friendly screeners. Um, and this is not to prevent you from receiving care, but to determine where is the most appropriate place for you to receive the, the care that you need. Um, does it need to be in our dedicated respiratory unit that's in a special part of the hospital with its own entrance? 
um, or can it be up in the, the clinic? Um, it also allows us as providers to have the correct PPE um, to care for you and keep our patients who are at increased risk safe um, by keeping the higher risk um, people um, out of the, the general area of the, the hospital. Um, but we're here to, to take care of you. Um, we're also using telehealth um, platform to take care of our assisted living um, patients where we can work closely with the staff there so they don't have to leave the facility and put the whole um, facility at risk um, by leaving. Um, and it's worked out really well for our patients in the community. Thanks, Brian. Um, we know that, that patients and families are, are nervous about coming in for care. That's, that's part of why we're doing this series. Um, can you share with the viewers, what do they put off or what do they risk by putting off regularly scheduled care or screening care? Right, that, Carol, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I've talked to, to many patients who are very scared to come into the hospital. Um, some of them flat out refusing and they really don't need to be. Um, we're, we're doing all the things needed to make the, the hospital probably the, the safest um, building here in New London. Um, and probably that goes for, I know it goes for Cheshire as well as Alice Peck Day Hospital, as well as Dartmouth-Hitchcock. Um, by delaying their routine screening, they may be delaying a cancer diagnosis. Um, and I don't wanna scare anyone, but by delaying that diagnosis, they may be changing the course of their treatment. They may be preventing a cure when um, one could be had. Um, people who have heart disease and aren't seeking care may be causing more muscle damage and more heart damage um, that will affect their quality of life um, for many years um, down the road. So we want people to come in, get their mammograms, get the care they need for their diabetes, their heart disease, high blood pressure, and whatever chronic um, other medical conditions they have. Um, we're here, we're, we're ready to, to take care of our, our patients. Great. I just wanna, I wanna just say that I completely agree. I'm sorry, I wanna agree with, with Brian and say you're much safer right now coming to any of the hospitals in this system than going to Walmart by, <laughs> yes. by a thousand fold. Yeah. By far. Yes. yes. We're screening and we're cleaning. Yes. Yeah. We, uh, we have a whole team that goes through and wipes all the, the doorknobs, the chair rails, um, pretty much any surface that can be touched by a visitor or staff member twice a day. Um, it is, we are just cleaning and, and getting any potential um, germs off these surfaces. So um, please come in. Um, if you're, especially if you're gonna go out to dinner, you're gonna go to Walmart, um, go to the um, grocery store, we are a much safer place to be. Great. Before I ask Dr. Parati to chime in, I just wanna remind people to email your questions to social at hitchcock.org. So some of you may not realize that visiting nurse and hospice for New Hampshire and Vermont is one of the Dartmouth-Hitchcock system members. Um, since they provide in-home care for patients, their protocols to keep people safe are very different. So Danielle, can you share with us what you and your teams are doing to keep patients, families, as well as themselves safe as they provide in-home care? Yes, thank you so much for asking and including us in this conversation. I think it's really valuable just to remind everybody of how far we are. So VNH serves both New Hampshire and Vermont. Our total service area is about 4,000 square miles. We provide care to uh, about 1,400 people on multiple different programs and services on any given day. We do that with over 120 people driving around the countryside in their cars. That's a lot of people. Our clinical teams might interact with anywhere from five to 12 individual patients every single day. And we do this for all kinds of people, mothers, babies, pregnant women, um, people at the end of their life, people at all stages of health and wellness who just need some support to be able to stay home. And that's where we are. So we have a very different role to play in that we recognize community spread is a big part of what we are all talking about and worrying about these days. And as clinicians, we're in the community. So we have to be very attentive to everything that all of my peers have said, and remember that we're doing it in everyone else's house. It's a little bit different 
when we are going into the client's home, the patient's home, instead of them coming into our building. We can't go around and wash every hand railing because they're not our hand railings. So we have to really partner with the people that we are taking care of. We have to have really good, clear conversations about how we all work together to stay safe. Like everybody else, we use masks and face shields. Our team is, is wearing a face mask and covered with a plastic shield every visit, every time. And this is the most important thing that we can do for everyone involved. It keeps all of us from sharing those respiratory droplets that we've all learned about in the last few months here. Um, that ability to share and communicate with the patients that we're taking care of is really, really important. And I think one of the most fun things about this was that the staff on their own started to figure out that when they walk into a house, particularly with someone they haven't met before, and they're already wearing a mask and shield, it can be really intimidating, particularly if there are children around or people who might be experiencing some confusion or dementia. And these expert clinicians started to realize that if they wave at people through the windows or they ask people to open their front door before they approach the door while still maintaining social distance, they can be seen and they can wave and they can smile and they can make a relationship with someone before they have to put the mask and shield on. And that has really helped to improve prove comfort for everybody involved and made it a little less scary to have this total stranger knocking on your door looking, well, not quite like a person because they're wearing a mask and shield. And it's been one of the things that we really encourage all of our team members to do, especially when they're reaching out to new households. Okay. I also, okay. if I could just put in one other piece that um, the rest of the team is talking about the use of telehealth. And that is something that we've done some of. It's a little bit hard to help someone um, take a shower um, using a remote visit. However, one of the things that we have been able to do is support the relationship between people at home and their providers. So sometimes it's really hard particularly in our rural areas, to get an internet connection. Some people don't have the devices they need, and some people just are overwhelmed by trying to make the connections with their providers. In those cases, we'll go out and act as the, the in-between person. We'll bring our devices, we'll connect with the primary care, the physician that the person needs to talk with, and get it set up so that they can have that remote visit and support people staying home and still getting the care that they need. Wow. Thank you, Danielle. I love the efforts you're making to, to personalize it, that, that giving people the opportunity to see the smile and, and the caring. Um, that's been one of the hardest parts about wearing a mask, uh, even at work. I, I like to smile as I walk down the hallways, and, and now I have to hope people are looking at my eyes because that's right. what they're seeing. So you just have to give big smiles so it goes right up to your eyes. Um, and I have to say, too, I'm a nurse, and I really had no clue about all of the work that you and your team were doing to safely care for patients and families in their homes. So I have to imagine that this has been um, pretty informative to our viewers as well. Um, so Rachel, Michael, Brian, and Diane, or Danielle, sorry, with just a few minutes remaining, um, I want to give each of you an opportunity to share or reiterate a single point that you think would be helpful to people who are concerned for their safety or the safety of their families as we continue to, to move forward with scheduled care. And, and Rachel, I'll start with you. Oops, Rachel, you're on mute. Sorry, I said since you said eyes are, eyes are important, I'm taking my glasses off for this one. So, um, <laughs> Uh, my point is, and I'm, I was hoping you would ask this question, is now is the time to come in. And I'm saying that as a physician and as a mother and a family member, just like I would tell anyone in my family, now is the time. We know we're safe now. We don't know what it's going to be like in the future. We are safe. We, again, we haven't had a COVID case in, in over two months, but even if we did, we know how to be safe. So get that colonoscopy done now. Get your mammogram done now. Now is the time. And the second half of that is, this is not over. We can't pretend that it's over. We have to keep our community safe. So wear a mask in public, ensure social distancing, 
and wash your hands and let's keep New Hampshire and our community as safe as it is right now. Great, thank you. Mike. Yeah, I think, um, I think we're all gonna say something similar on the sort of the same themes that uh, Rachel just articulated, but uh, now is the time to get care. I think uh, all of us on this call have talked a little bit over the last couple of days of how we're doing that. I'm going back to get my primary care appointment, which is long overdue. I'm going to go to the dentist. Um, so we, we need to go back and get the care because we are safe right now. As Rachel said, we're, we're going to be safe moving forward. We know how to do this. We know how to take care of you. We know how to take care of this disease if, if it comes back. And I think that you know, just to say something I said uh, earlier is we have been very, very successful in New Hampshire uh, at hospitals and communities um, and we've been thoughtful and compassionate towards others, and we can continue to do that. And we will get through this. And um, some parts of the country are going to do better than others. And I really think that we are going to do really well in this region because we're all going to continue uh, to practice those safe behaviors and be thoughtful and compassionate. Great. Brian. So I, I, I will echo everything that Michael and Rachel said, but I, I want to thank the, the community of New Hampshire because they've allowed us to do as well as we have by wearing the yeah. mask, by social distancing, without people taking this seriously, we would not be in this um, position yep. we, we are now. Um, and I think we're seeing that um, in the country. So it, now is the time that they keep the foot on the gas pedal, to keep the, the pressure on this disease and not let up um, so that we can continue to move forward and keep people safe, allow them to get the care that they need and the prevention that they, they need um, and keep everyone safe in, in New Hampshire and Vermont. Yeah. And Danielle, not, uh, last but not least at all. Communicate with us. Whether you're going to an office or you're opening your door to one of my team members, talk to us. Talk to us about what your questions are. Talk to us about what we're doing to keep everyone safe. Talk to us about what your exposures or risks or concerns are. We want to partner with you. We know how to help everyone safe, stay safe. And we want to be able to make good decisions together. I think Mike said it great when he talked about compassion. But we are all here together. We are all the same community. We live here, we work here, and we are here to take care of our own neighbors. So talk to us. Great. So thank you, everyone. Those were all great points. Um, and I have one that I want to make as well. I want to remind everybody to let's all be safe and wear a mask. Wear a mask. Wear the mask. <laughs> thank you, everyone. All right. So, oops. Um, next week's webinar. Uh, first of all, I do want to thank our panel members, sorry, and our viewers. And if we didn't get to your questions, um, please again check in at our website, uh, go.dh.org backslash recovery, and we'll hopefully have those answered today for you. I uh, also want to remind people that next week's webinar will be the third in our four part series, and it's going to focus on how environmental services such as supply chain, food services, um, have adapted at DHMC and in our Southern Region clinics. And our panelists are going to include Tim Bishop, who is our Director of Engineering Services in the Southern Region, uh, Rich Cassano, who is our Director of Supply Chain Operations at Dartmouth-Hitchcock, and Zach Conaway, who is the Environmental Services Manager at Dartmouth-Hitchcock. So thank you again for joining us today, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.